So today we're... Hey gang, I just want to say at the top that I think it's really important for teachers of any peoples at any age, K through 12, university like myself, or just teaching a class for fun or making a YouTube video that purports to be informative, to admit at the front your limitations. And so I am, as I've mentioned a few times to uh, some, in some video somewhere, I must have said, right? I'm a Cold War China historian. That's my expertise. I know about China's relations, foreign relations with other countries during the Cold War, and a lot about its domestic history under Mao Zedong. So with that in mind, teaching a pre-world history course is sometimes a little bit difficult. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to talk about Asia, broadly defined. Uh, North Africa, I feel like I've got a decent handle on. Europe is not so bad, but the Americas are a real weak spot for me. There's a lot of questions you will have uh, that come up over the course of this lecture, and I just wanted to recommend, if you found this YouTube video on accident, you should check out Ancient Americas if you're into this kind of thing. And if you're watching this video because you have to, you should probably still check out Ancient Americas if you see something or hear something that I say that is interesting, but what I've had to say about it is unfulfilling. I just watched their video on Cahokia and I thought it was super interesting. What is Cahokia? Well, we'll talk about it in this lecture. Or you could just go to Ancient Americas but not if you're my student. We're going to start our story here with the development of agriculture in Mesoamerica. We will eventually move up into North America, then down into the Andes, and out into Polynesia and New Zealand. But let's start here in Mesoamerica. Agriculture developed differently, and I find this so interesting, differently in the Americas than it did in Eurasia. Now, traditionally, what we've been going around saying is that if you want agriculture, what you have to have is two things. One, the cultivation of plants, and two, the domestication of animals, the turning animals into farming tools. Now, here in Mesoamerica, we're going to have the domestication of plants, but even straight through Mayan civilization, we never have the domestication of animals. Other places in the Americas do, but not here. It's also interesting to note that agriculture in Mesoamerica doesn't grow up around rivers or in alluvial plains like we've seen in other places. Here, instead, it grows in a sort of plateau region in the highlands of what will become Mexico, beginning sometime around 5000 BCE. The first people to achieve agriculture in the Americas were the Tehuacan, in what is now the state of Puebla in what is now Mexico. Archaeological evidence of things like grinding stones dates back to about 5000 BCE and gives us reliable proof of early grass cultivation. Now, you're already saying, friend, I thought they grew maize. I thought they grew basically corn. Yes, they did. Fun fact for you to take away, corn is a grass. Anyway, it's thought that they actually started growing maize sometime around 7000 BCE, but nowhere in the 2000 years before they begin growing maize, and we find grinding stones in the archaeological record, do they ever bother settling, domesticating draft animals, and never do they in what I have to say about Mesoamerica in this lecture. Maize is a pretty, as plans go, easy thing to cultivate. It needs very little tending to, very little looking after once it's been planted. The kernels from maize are also very easy to store. If you can put them through a drying process, they will hang around for a long time without going bad. They could also be ground into a paste and baked and stored that way. The peoples here in very early Mesoamerica ate very little meat. Instead, they replaced the nutrients the one would normally get from meat, B12 and things like that, with the cultivation of squash and beans alongside maize. By 2500 BCE or so, the population in this region had grown to be 25 times larger than it is at the beginning, or at least confirmed beginning of agriculture in 5000 BCE. 
The largest settlements, however, were still only a few hundred, and by this point, that's a little small compared to what's happening in, say, the eastern Mediterranean, Egypt, and so forth. By 1500 BCE, Mesoamerica is fully agriculturally based. Everyone has made the transition. In this world, a very significant early people to develop a complex society following some, if not all, of our definitions of a complex society are the Olmec people. This is a society that arises around the Gulf of Mexico from modern-day Veracruz to what is modern-day Tabasco, and they are able to develop themselves because they begin raising two crops of maize per year, doubling their agricultural output compared to people around them, increasing the surplus that the sort of ruling classes of society can extract through taxes and then redistribute either in the form of grand monuments or holding them back for the people or something like that, and to use it to commission pretty impressive works of art. Here, the sort of takeaway of the Olmec people, what I hope you remember, is the high level of sculpting skill that's developed by this society. It gives us, of course, A, everywhere we see sculpting and things like that at a very high level, evidence of a clear and probably somewhat rigid, or at least defined, division of labor. And it also speaks to the power of the king, because what are they sculpting? They're sculpting these huge heads. These heads could be between five and 10 feet tall, so they could weigh up to 40 tons. And they're all of them made out of a, of a resource called basalt. And the closest basalt deposits to Olmec society are 50 miles away or longer. Now this is a society, like all of Mesoamerica, that has not just the peculiarity of having never dr created draft animals for agriculture, this society, like the Mayans, they never use the wheel. Some societies, the Mayans especially, know what the wheel is, never bother with it. So this isn't just in the Olmec society, a king whose power is sufficient to demand that heads be carved in their honor. It's not just a society where the king can demand that uh, massive, very heavy rock be moved to carve that head, but he has the power to demand that either be carried or moved by rafts. It's very inconvenient. It's a huge process. Speaks to the power, speaks to the division of labor, and speaks to the incredible level of skill of these sculptors. Probably the most famous sort of artifact from this very, very early history of Mesoamerica, however, is something called the Long Count. The Long Count was a calendar that, unlike our calendar, ran cumulatively. So it starts at a day equivalent to about August 11, 3114 BCE, and just moves straight forward, adding days until it gets to the end. It was used uh, most often around 4th and 5th centuries BCE, and the calendar, if you know which calendar I'm talking about, you already know, it ends quite famously December 21, 2012, resulting in a lot of really hokey disaster movies in the early 2010s. It's a fairly interesting calendar if you think about it, one that moves cumulatively instead of cyclically. So consider our calendar January to December and then starts over 365 days all the time, except of course for leap years every fourth year. This calendar does not operate that way. It just adds. The calendar came into use when successors of the Olmec eventually built monuments with these long count dates on them. And it gives us an insight into their numbering system as well, which is essentially a system, as you can see here, of bars and dots that show in, on the calendar different years, but correlate to different numbers. So we're also in a society where we have math and so forth. The largest city to exist in Mesoamerica before the modern era, before roughly 1500, however, is not an Olmec city. It is a city called Teotihuacan. Around 200 BCE, Mesoamericans found this city. And as I said, it's the biggest city in Mesoamerica and in North America in general. 
before about 1500. It grows until roughly 650 CE, so it exists for 850 years, that's quite a good run, and has a population that varies at different points between 40,000 and 200,000. Now, by 650 CE, other places in the world, 200,000 is not that large of an urban population, but for the Americas, that really matters. That's really, really big, really, really dense. And elements of it sort of would have looked like a uh, well-planned city you might see, you know, in the Midwest of America. So I, I imagine something like Chicago. Why? Because it was laid out on a well-organized grid. All the streets form a grid, and many of these streets would have been lined by one-story apartment compounds. These apartments not totally home, homey, you know, I, I, I love a window. I, I just, I, I need natural light. It's, it's part of my generation. Surely my generation's home decor desi desires will, will never go bad. We love windows, open spaces, windows everywhere, not the people of Teotihuacan. They live in windowless apartments, but they decorate the inside with incredibly colorful frescoes. So it's still quite nice. Probably the most striking thing about their homes, however, is not the lack of sunshine, not the colorful frescoes, but the existence of waste water plumbing, a sewer. Inside, friends, their apartments, they had access to sewer built by the city, and that, I think, is very impressive. It's unknown exactly what this city was for. We don't know if it was a political capital, a religious capital, something like that. We just know that it was very, very large by Mesoamerican standards. Around 600 CE, we also know that some kind of internal revolt within this city resulted in a fire that burned down significant sections of the city. And instead of rebuilding, instead of repairing and trying to regrow, the peoples living in Teotihuacan make the decision to simply disperse. The population in the city quickly declines and it's just left there to essentially become ruins. As we move on to the Maya, I just wanted to stop and fulfill a sort of promise made in something I said earlier, that these people in Mesoamerica are absolutely fascinating for the decision-making they made as a civilization around the technology of the wheel. What you see before you is a Mayan toy. You can see it has, you know, at this panther's paws, I assume it's a panther, it has four wheels. Those axles, of course, would not have stood the test of time. Those have been recreated. But the thing itself is a genuine agri... But the thing itself is a genuine archaeological artifact, and look at it, there you have it, wheels. So they know what wheels are, but somewhat mysteriously just make the decision to never use them. Who then were the Maya? They are, now, an indigenous people living in modern-day Yucatan, Belize, Honduras, and Guatemala. Uh, they were, in their day, a complex society that reached its height during what is traditionally called the classical period in all history there's always debates about periodization we'll go with what is you know traditional standard here and during this classical period they would have sort of fully developed their own written language it is as i said a complex society but they don't just not use the wheel they don't just not use draft animals because there are no draft animals there is in this society also no plow and there very well could not be, and if there were, it would have to be wooden, because the Mayan never also developed metal tools. Very interesting. Let's talk then about this classical period. What is this classical period? Well, it's from about 250 to 920 CE, when Mayan civilization is taken to be kind of at its height. There is, however, undeniable evidence of major urban complexes even before this classical period begins. We have, for example, El Mirador. Excuse my pronunciation, Spanish is not one of my languages. They would have had around it, this major city, about 50 surrounding cities, occupying 2,500 square miles of jungle in total. This early Mayan civilization 
located in northern Guatemala and southwestern Mexico. And El Mirador itself, just the one central city, would have covered about six square miles. It would have had a population of about 100,000 people and would have existed not within that 250 to 920 CE window, but sometime between 300 and 200 BCE, well before the classical period begins. This city had an enormous uh, pyramid called La Danta. It had a water collection system for higher yield crops, so there's a lot of very interesting and complex infrastructure already going on. It's unknown if this early version of Mayan civilization had a writing system. What is known is that it is abandoned, as you can see from the photo, of course, but it's been abandoned for a long time. Been abandoned since around 200 CE. What's the point? Just to say, the pre-classical period was already very, very developed. The peoples living in Guatemala, southwestern Mexico, had been you know, working hard at sort of building their civilization for quite a long time. Monument building in this culture ebbs and flows over time. In some cities, monument building stopped for a period of about 50 years between 550 and 600 CE, which marks the end of the early and the beginning of the late classical periods. The last monument is built in 909 CE, which is considered the end of the sort of late period. Our Maya people here also develop a very complex and fully thought out writing system that for much of the time that we've known about it was undeciphered. It doesn't get deciphered until the 1970s. And the problem, the sort of sticking point, was it couldn't be decided based on how many symbols there are in the language, if it was phonetic, if it was pictorial, or what. It turns out, it's all of them. It's phonetic, it's pictorial, that sort of thing. It's, it's three total methods mashed together. Since 1973, about 85% of this language has been, to date, deciphered. If we want to understand the Maya with a little more granularity, we can turn to what is a fairly typical city-state, Copan. And in Copan, we, we enter a city that has uh, a really rigid social stratification system, really rigid social classes. We have a ruling family, a nobility, ordinary people, and their slaves. This is a city that would have peaked around the 700s CE. The ruler would have been a highly ranked military leader, and his main job would have been to decide when to ally with another city-state and when to go to war. This is not a small decision-making process, and it's not a rare decision-making process. War is a very important part of this culture, as we will soon see. Succession here is incredibly interesting. When a ruler dies in the city-state of Copan, it's not the case that that ruler's son just takes the throne, moves in without question. Instead, a council of elders meet, and they then determine whether or not the son is a good enough military commander to be able to to rule. Will the son be able to make the call, wisely choose who our allies are, who our enemies are, when is it time for war, when is it time for peace, these kinds of things. So the son can't just automatically take the throne. If the council doesn't believe that the son is qualified to do this, he's out. Instead, they pick someone from another high-ranking noble family to take over the place of king in the city-state. Who then are these nobles? They're rich folk, wealthy families. They live in very large homes. In Copan, the section of the city for nobles was called the House of Officials. One compound, and only one, within this House of Officials section of the city would contain about 40 or 50 buildings, about 11 courtyards, and this is where our nobles lived. The Mayan word for noble meant he whose descent is known on both sides, meaning that in Mayan civilization, it was not just patrilineal. It was not just matrilineal. Both sides matter. Maya inspected both your mother's family and your father's family when considering where you fell within the social hierarchy. Now, among the nobility, scribes in this society are of particularly high rank. Math is particularly important for maintaining this calendar, the calendar we've already mentioned, the long count. 
Around 350 CE, Maya specialists became the first people in the world, and this is a problem with teaching and understanding pre-modern history, going through all of the firsts of things that are so obvious to you in your life. Now, Mayan specialists, 350 CE, the first mathematicians in the world to use the numeral zero. The concept of zero is invented here as a placeholder. Additionally, astronomers knew the stars so well that they could predict, Mayan culture, they could predict eclipses, and they used these skills to determine the best days for crowning new kings, for starting wars, and that kind of thing. So math becomes incredibly, incredibly important here. Now, if you find yourself among the ordinary classes, but you're still fairly well off, what does that mean you're doing? It means most likely you are a long distance trader. What are you trading? You're trading salt, which would have been collected from beaches and moved inland. Gold is discovered in the region of the Maya about the year 1000, and they learned how to work it, but they made very few items out of metal. They preferred, very much so, green jade. The most important trade good, however, was not salt, was not gold, was not jade. It was a volcanic glass obsidian. Regular people farmed, but they had to walk one or two days outside the city to get to their farmland. Most actual farm work in this society is done by slaves, and where are those slaves coming from? I've already iterated how important war is in deciding a leader. Those slaves are captives of war. Then there is the religious world of the Maya, and you might think that blood sacrifice and things like that, which you probably guessed we're going to be getting to, only involve the lower ranks of society. That is not true. Ritual royal bloodletting is also incredibly important. Now, we don't have a clear, clear answer as to why, but we know from surviving paintings that it was. There are many paintings that involve, for example, women running thorny vines through their tongues to create uh, bleeding in the mouth for sacrifice, as well as men, kings, sticking bone tools through their penises, puncturing them to allow blood to flow out there onto an altar for sacrifice. Probably the most important literary source we have from the Maya people is the Popol Vu the council book. It's sort of a key religious text in many ways. It's, it's an accounting of creation and things like that. It explains a series of games where players use their hips to move a ball past an opponent's goal. And if you are any uh, of my personal Guatemalan neighbors, you never cease, at least when the, the World Cup is on, to remind me that it is Maya people who have the largest hand in world history in inventing soccer, and this is the thing they are pointing to. The Maya believed that the Earth was actually recreated every time this game was played, and usually it was a Maya team being tested by the gods against a team comprised of prisoners of war, and these prisoners of war, you might guess, always lose. These these prisoners once they once you've once you've played this game once the world has been recreated to thank the gods for having recreated the world once more of course there, a sacrifice is entailed and in this case it is not royal bloodletting it is the human sacrifice of these prisoners of war in a fairly elaborate ceremony now the Popol Vuh goes on to explain that all Maya gods are descended from one divine pair of gods. What is in your textbook translated as the lizard house father who invented writing and supported learning and the lady rainbow a mother who was god of weaving and god of medicine she helped women with the pain of childbirth and so she's also related to sort of fertility and surviving the pregnancy process other gods existed for merchants soldiers and so on and so forth maya rulers sacrificing prisoners to these gods depending on the need. In Mayan religion, you could, if you wanted, commune with the gods and especially with the underworld. And in this corner of the earth where there are so many deep caves, you might imagine that those caves are seen as portals to that underworld. 
Shibalba. The Maya would often go to these caves to contact the dead. Of the many rituals involved to communicate with the dead, many included using, for example, an enema of intoxicants. Uh, putting any kind of intoxicant in you via enema into your butt gets it into the bloodstream extremely fast, so you would have, whatever hallucinogen it is they're using, would have hit very quickly. And there are many bones, bone tubes and things like that left behind as evidence of exactly this practice, along with paintings in important caves about how it would be done. It is unclear what fluid it was exactly they used, but it is an, a curious and, and pretty interesting practice. It is then, I think, worth it, because we won't be with the Maya for much longer, to take a direct look at the Popol Vuh and the first two passages that pertain to the creation story. The first two passages, the primordial world and the creation of the world, are short, but I think they're very evocative and stand on their own as great works of pre-modern literature. The text begins, These, then, are the first words, the first speech. There is not yet one person, one animal, bird, fish, crab, tree, rock, hollow, canyon, meadow, or forest. All alone the sky exists. The face of the earth has not yet appeared. Alone lies the expanse of the sea, along with the womb of all the sky. There is not yet anything gathered together. All is at rest, nothing stirs. All is languid at rest in the sky. There is not yet anything standing erect. Only the expanse of the water, only the tranquil sea lies alone. There is not yet anything that might exist. All lies placid and silent in the darkness in the night. All alone are the framer and the shaper, sovereign and the quetzal serpent, they who have borne children and they who have begotten sons. Luminous they are in the water wrapped in Quetzal feathers and Cotinga feathers. Thus they are called Quetzal Serpent. In their essence, they are great sages, great possessors of knowledge. Thus surely there is the sky. There is also heart of sky, which is said to be the name of the God. The second passage, the creation of the world. Then came his word. Heart of sky arrived here with Sovereign and Quetzal Serpent in the darkness in the night. He spoke with Sovereign and Quetzal Serpent. They talked together then. They thought and they pondered. They reached an accord, bringing together their words and their thoughts. Then they gave birth, heartening one another. Beneath the light they gave birth to humanity. Then they arranged for the germination and creation of the trees and bushes, the germination of all life and creation, in the darkness and in the night, by heart of sky, who is called Huracan. First is Thunderbolt Huracan. Second is Youngest Thunderbolt. Third is Sudden Thunderbolt. These three together are Heart of Sky. Then they came together with Sovereign and Quetzal Serpent. Together they conceived light and life. How shall it be sown? When shall there be a dawn for anyone? Who shall be a provider? Who shall be a sustainer? Then be it so. You are conceived. May the water be taken away, emptied out, so that the plate of earth may be created. May it be gathered and become level. Then may it be sown. Then may dawn the sky and the earth. There can be no worship, no reverence given by what we have framed and what we have shaped until humanity has been created, until people have been made, they said. Then the earth was created by them. Merely their word brought about the creation of it. In order to create the earth, they said, earth, and immediately it was created. Just like a cloud, like a mist, was the creation and formation of it. Then they called forth the mountains from the water. Straight away the great mountains came to be. It was merely their spirit essence, their miraculous power, that brought about the conception of the mountains and valleys. Straight away were created cypress groves and pine forests to cover the face of the earth. Thus Quetzal Serpent rejoiced. It is good that you have come, Heart of Sky, you, Huracan, and you as well, youngest Thunderbolt and sudden Thunderbolt. That which we have framed and shaped shall turn out well, they said. First the earth was created, the mountains and the valleys. The waterways were divided, their branches coursing among the mountains. Thus the waters were divided, revealing the great mountains. Thus creation of the earth, created then by Heart of Sky and Heart of Earth, as they are called. They were the first to conceive it. The sky was set apart. 
the earth also was set apart within the waters. Thus was conceived the successful completion of the work when they thought and when they pondered. And thus we come to the end of the Mayan earth creation story. All said there were about 60 Mayan city states. What was their relationship? Some kings ruled over other kings but we're not sure how alliances were actually formed. The goal was to gain more territory. Maya were often at war, these, these little city-states fighting among each other. The weapons they used would have been spears, darts, slingshots. They did not have, however, bows and arrows. Battle was sometimes a raid, sometimes a full battle. There would have been traps, there would have been ambushes. You would have caught yourself in a rain of darts and stones if you were subject to an ambush. There was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. The goal was not, however, primarily territory, primarily gaining land. One wanted to dominate as much land as possible to dominate the real resource, to dominate people. Mesoamerica is a land-rich and people-poor place. People are the resource for which you go to war. Some people here were captured as slaves and then sacrificed. Others were captured as slaves and then forced to work in fields, as I mentioned earlier. Nobles who are captured from other cities could be held in captivity for decades. Ordinary soldiers and higher-ranking prisoners would suffer ritual bloodletting, appeasing Mayan gods. The Maya would, in some of these bloodletting ceremonies, remove fingernails, cut open chests and tear out hearts, and publicly behead those who underwent the most extreme forms of blood sacrifice. Peak Mayan power was sometime around 750 CE, when they would have had a population of about 8 to 10 million people. Around the year 800, however, we enter a period of decline. Maybe it was too much war, maybe it was prolonged drought, it's possible they ran out of resources, it's possible people just got tired of this and eventually walked away. Between 910 and 1500, Maya culture emerged again in a place you've heard of, probably Chichen Itza, northern Yucatan area. There, about 1000 to 1200 is the peak for this place. And it was never as big as during the classical period, but there it still stood. Here you see an early European photo of it, never, however, reaching the height we just described. Let us turn then to North America. The first complex societies in North America are going to plant maize, just like our complex societies in Mesoamerica, but they are going to emerge after the Maya come on the scene. The first two complex societies are known as the Mississippian culture and the Anasazi. North American people hunted and gathered until about 500 BCE to about 100 CE when we get the emergence of the Adena people who built large earthen works along the Ohio River Valley. The Adena themselves did not farm, but their successors, the Hopewell, did. They cultivated maize, beans, and squash, just like we had seen of the Maya people, the Olmec, and those before them. And they created, compared to the Adena, even larger earthen works in Ohio, in Illinois, and along the Mississippi River. There are no major urban areas to report from Hopewell culture, but they had large trade networks that extended from Florida into the Rocky Mountains and over west into Mexico. The first large urban centers were built by Mississippian peoples, roughly 800 to 1450. And here, these Mississippian people largely followed a Mayan plan. It was temples on earthen mounds in a central plaza. The first to develop the bow and arrow are these people sometime around 900. The largest surviving mound is in Cahokia, the Cahokia Mounds, just east of St. Louis. There are, it is the largest one, about 100 feet high, about 1,000 feet long. Cahokia would have had a population of about 30,000, the biggest air, the biggest sort of urban center in North America. And this large mound in Cahokia would have existed alongside about 84 other known mounds. There is, in this region, evidence of sacrifice. One mound, 
for example, contained the corpses of 110 young women. Why exactly they were sacrificed, however, is not definitely known. Moving away from Mississippian cultures, the Anasazi existed in Colorado, Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. They would have been in direct contact with the Maya as well. During the Anasazi's Pueblo period, they built two kinds of houses. One was sort of a pit house carved out of the ground, and another was a brick and mortar house with log roofs, a Pueblo you're probably a little more used to seeing. These things could be absolutely enormous. By one Pueblo structure in Chaco, New Mexico, was five stories tall and contained 800 rooms. The Anasazi, unfortunately, experienced a sudden decline around 1200, and we do not know why. I will say for those of you who have to watch this video, who are located in and around Atlanta, this picture is not a picture of any of the groups that we discussed. This is the Etowah Indian Mounds in North Georgia. These are similar earthenworks, and I suggest you go, because it is a really fun time. Let us then move south. So we're leaving North America, going south of Mesoamerica into the Andean region. And in the Andean region, we find several complex societies emerging, prospering and then collapsing between 3100 BCE and 1000 CE. This is, this is a region that includes modern day Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, and Chile. Some of these are societies that came about 2000 years before the Olmec with, you know, that came earlier in this lecture. They would have lived in city-states with large urban centers, but never the size of Teotihuacan. The Andean Mountains shaped these civilizations deeply. In the east, rainfall is frequent and heavy. Irrigation of, uh, to fields is pretty easy. Very little rainfall, however, to the west, on the western side of the Andean Mountains. Most of what they eat in this region is potatoes, supplemented by squash, chili peppers, beans, and sometimes maize, only grown, however, at low altitudes in the mountain ranges. The earliest domesticated squash in this region dates to about 4000 BCE. And here we get something that we did not have when we were in Mesoamerica. Here we do get a fuller, uh, more, let's say, standard definition of agriculture. We get domesticated animals this time the llama and the alpaca. Both animals, the llama and the alpaca, can carry up to about 100 pounds for a space of about 10 to 12 miles. In this context, they were used for farming and for eating. They were never, however, ridden. They cannot really sustain the weight of an adult human. The main source of animal protein in this region, however, is not llamas, is not alpacas. You don't want to eat those. Those are really expensive and really important tools. The main source of protein is guinea pigs. The earliest urban center in the Americas, and I mean anywhere in the Americas at all, is a city called Corral. It's about 100 miles north of Lima in Peru and about 14 miles away from the Pacific coast. And we've known about this place for a long time, but it was only in 2001 that we were able to date it to about 3100 BCE. It contains five small pyramids and one very large one, about 60 feet tall, covering five total acres. Inside we, of this pyramid, there have been discovered 32 carved flutes from condor and pelican bone, bird and monkey decorations, and other sort of uh, handcrafted tools, perhaps venerating, perhaps just representing the natural world. It is not known why this place was abandoned. It just was. About 1200 BCE, 2000 years after Corral, we get Chavan, about 60 miles north of the old site of Corral. Here we have large temples, U-shaped structures, sculptures to jaguars, snakes, and eagles, sometimes combined with human parts to create sort of hybrid half-snake, half-human, half-jaguar, half-human kind of entities. About 350 BCE, we get the last years of the Chavan culture and the emergence of several smaller regional cultures. The most famous of these smaller regional cultures is the Nazca, who carved the Nazca lines. Now, as I said at the beginning, if you really want to dig into this stuff, I suggest if you're staying on a streaming platform, you should check out Ancient Americas, who has a great video on the Nazca and how they created these lines. These are massive. You can see the lower left photo on the PowerPoint slide. Massive alterations 
to the landscape created by human hands in a, in a fantastic amount of planning and calculation. It boggles the mind. Moving on, we get Tawanaku, somewhere between 600 and 1,000, and this would have been the biggest Andean political center. Tawanaku was 12 miles south of Lake Titicaca in southern Bolivia. It rests about 11,800 feet above sea level. Archaeologists believe that power extended through Bolivia, Argentina, and into northern Chile and southern Peru, power from this place. Would have had a population at its peak of about 40,000 people, would have used a raised field system of irrigation, which were sort of channels dug around fields and kept fields from freezing when at these incredible high elevations it gets very cold at night. So they're using tunnels of water, channels of water to insulate their fields to keep them safe from, you know, the cold. Now, unlike Mesoamerica, between seven or 800 Andean people started working with metal, something that doesn't really happen in Mesoamerica, and they become exceptionally good at it. Bronze mixing with copper and tin and copper and arsenic, so different types of bronze, and they began minting tools as well as using coins, mostly if not for money, at least for burial rituals. Moving right along, we sail into Polynesia. And there are two here major groups of Pacific Islands. First, those close to Australia and Indonesia, Micronesia, Melanesia, and New Guinea. And the second group of Pacific Islands, the Polynesian Triangle, Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand. And there are thousands of islands within this second group, New Zealand being its biggest. The islands of Micronesia and Melanesia are very, very close together. Many of them are within sight of each other. So it's very easy to know when you set sail, you know, and no one's ever done this before, that you will get somewhere. This is not true elsewhere. There is, for example, 2,250 miles between Peru and Easter Island. Hawaii was reached sometime before about the year 300, Easter Island around about 400. New Zealand, the last place on Earth humans finally reach, not until 1350, that's 1350 CE. All of these people, these Polynesian people, generally speak a language that comes from one large linguistic family, much like the Indo-European is this very massive linguistic family. Polynesian people in their languages come from a linguistic family called the Oceanic language family. You might ask, how do we know, how do we order these things? The answer is that we follow around the existence archaeologically of Lapita pottery. It begins in Melanesia around 1500 BCE, and then moves on quickly to New Guinea, then Tonga and Samoa about 500 years later. And so it's through the existence of that pottery in the archaeological record and the dating of it, that we can date when humans moved where across these islands. As I hopefully said in the very first of these lectures, the peopling of the world, we have no clear idea on when the canoe was invented. The problem is it's, you know, that early in the human record, it's going to be made of wood, it's going to be very thin so it can float, which means it's going to disintegrate pretty quickly, you know, when we're looking at time on the scale of millennia. We do, however, know when the double canoe was invented, and that's about 100 CE. The double canoe is far more powerful than just a canoe by itself, maybe even twice as powerful. No, the, a double canoe is capable of moving about 100 to 150 miles a day, which is quite fast. If we think about that distance from Peru to Easter Island, 2,250 miles, that's 22.5 days at the slowest that you could get there on a double canoe. It's also more stable than single canoe, so it's better at deeper water travel. And in a double canoe, you can carry cargo, far more cargo than you can carry in a single canoe. Beyond that, a double canoe has a place for a sail, which a single canoe does not. So now we're talking about, once we've got the double canoe, wind-powered travel, essential for long 
ocean trips. And these double canoes are exactly how people are moving between these islands to places like Tahiti and Hawaii. Now, Europeans recorded life in villages of Tahiti and Hawaii beginning in about the 1700s, and it is general historical practice to kind of combine archaeological evidence with these much later first-hand written down accounts by Europeans to try to get at what life in this region was like before the 1700s. There are, there is of course some problems with this. Life is going to, it's, you don't want to assume that life goes unchanged from when they land in Hawaii to the 1700s, but these are the resources we have. So these are the resources that we use. Uh, historians generally think that Polynesian life was basically the broadest outlines of it similar for much of this period. What was political life like? Well, there were chiefs who were mostly men, they mostly lead lives of leisure, and they are mostly supported by gifts from lower ranking members of their population. It's thought that, at least in the very earliest days of this migration and settlement, there would have been a little bit more gender equality than these Europeans found in the 1700s. Settlement of the Pacific, very obviously, would have required men and women, and you cannot have either men or women just as dead weight on these canoes. This means that women had to be trained in these you know, core life skills like sailing just as much as men did. As they traveled, they would have brought along with them dogs and small rats as sources of protein and, you know, keeping these things alive when they get to the islands, keeping them alive probably also on the boats. And sometimes these men and these women sailing together with their dogs and their rats as protein in these boats, the way they find these islands is simply by accident. One gets blown off course in a storm, and if one does not die, one finds a new island, and on that island you build your new life. In addition to these dogs and these rats, which they take with them to populate these new islands, they also brought with them potted plants. This is how we get, for example, taro across the Pacific, a root plant that emerges when uh, on these islands across the Pacific when these peoples are bringing them potted on their double canoes, hoping to settle somewhere new. Now, I've said that a lot of these islands in Polynesia are discovered by accident as a result of being blown off in a storm or something like that, and that is, as far as we know, true. But don't let that fact downplay the incredible accuracy and intricacy of Polynesian navigational knowledge. This is a knowledge that would have brought people to Hawaii, to Tahiti, and allowed them to actually return, take return trips. It's not the case that you land on an island and then you're stuck there. You can use the stars to get back to where you came from and to establish very long distance trade. No one knows, however, despite the fact that it's Polynesian navigational knowledge moving a lot of people around the Pacific Ocean, no one knows how anyone ever reached Easter Island. The nearest neighbor to Easter Island, to put it in context, is about uh, 1,300 miles away, Pitcairn Island. So moving very slow, that's only 13 days on a double canoe, but Easter Island is also incredibly, incredibly small. It's just one island, it's not a network of islands, and it's only 14 miles at its widest. That's a really small target to try to hit on purpose from 13 days away. Because it is so isolated, it must, must, must have been discovered by accident, and it, this one actually stays isolated for a long time. Now, because of that, the languages that were spoken there become very interesting. They are thought to contain some of the most archaic Polynesian words. Why is it called Easter Island? Not because the people there celebrated Easter, but because the Dutch navigators who find it in 1722 find it on Easter Sunday. In the 1800s, Polynesian sailors named it Rapa Nui, which is still in use among Polynesian speakers as a name for the island. What are they eating there? Well, they're eating sweet potatoes, taro, sugarcane. Chicken is the only domesticated animal at all on the island, and their garbage pits from archaeological digs contain bones from dolphins, porpoise, and tuna, which means they weren't just fishing, they were deep sea fishing. The Maui, the iconic volcanic rock statues you see in this photo, 
these are sort of synonymous with Easter Island, yes? They number 887 in total. Some are taller than even 70 feet. Construction began around the year 1000 and continued for quite a while, and it's impressive because this is a place with no metal tools. It would have been a population of about, at its max, 15,000 people building these things. The average weight of one of them is up to 10 tons. The average weight, not the heaviest. The heaviest itself is 270 tons, and no two statues are the same. Although you cannot see them in this photo, they all contain sort of facial tattoos and things like that carved into them, making them all different, representing the people they were carved to memorialize. Memorialize? Yes, memorialize. All of them are statues built to portray ancestral leaders. How were they then developed? It's a combination of stone choppers and water put to work on soft volcanic rock. Production of these things stops sometime around 1600, over a hundred years before the Dutch navigators find this place and name it Easter Island. Near constant war on the island between small groups eventually depleted the island's resources, and the environment itself, by the time it's discovered by Dutch navigators, was completely degraded. To give you some idea, there were no trees and no large animals of any kind on the island by the 1700s. The people themselves resorted to using human bone and hair to make fishing tools in order to find food. Something we've seen in pre-modern human activity, beginning uh, most recently with Easter Island, is uh, maybe a bit of a correction to a kind of popularly held myth that there's a time somewhere in the distant past when humans were somehow closer to nature or deeper to a natural human state that we had a kind of balance with nature and that is true in some places but it's not true everywhere and there are many many things we could say about the last place humans finally settle but i think this will be a sort of interesting myth dispelling point we can make about New Zealand. So New Zealand is the last place humans arrive. We get there in about 1350, or those are the oldest artifacts we can find. Within about a century of the arrival of the Maori people on New Zealand, they had managed to wipe out about 20 different species of birds. One of these birds, the giant moa bird, they would have had to have killed about 160,000 of them. This is a species that sometimes stands over 10 feet tall. It's an enormous and apparently very delicious bird. They also depleted seal and sea lion populations around the island, and once the animal populations became too small, then they finally turned to cultivation. And in turning to cultivation, they cut down about 40% of the island's forest cover. By the time Europeans arrived in New Zealand in the 1700s, the Maori were living a very difficult life. They were living as small, warring bands, fighting with each other, competing over what were, by that point, very meager resources. Now, that's not the only thing we could say about the Maori, but in a class this large, sweeping so fast, I think maybe one thing we should do is, again, dispel myths, and that seems like a decent myth, this idea that once we were in tune with nature and now we are not, We've never been completely in or out of tune with nature. That's a good point to make here. And with that, I'm done. I'll see you in the next video.